will have her presentation immediate after the introduction. So first of all, let me introduce the paper presenter, paper presenter Windy J. Werner. She is the country manager International Finance Corporation. Oh, sorry. I missed out our one of our very valuable uh, discussion today. Official discussion, Mr. Professor Dr. Naoki Yoshino. He's the Dean and Chief Executive Officer of the Asian Development Bank Institute, ADB Institute. With this word, ladies and gentlemen, let me uh, invite Mrs. Miss. Wendy Werner to present her paper. You can go to the, if you wish. Oh, you have a present. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, dear respected uh, chair, Mr. Afdabul Islam, uh, former president of AmCham and DCCI, uh, Mr. Nishat Kumar, um, Dr. Fozal Kabir Khan, Professor Salim Rahan and Dr. Noyuki Noshino-san. Thank you all for uh, coming to this session after lunch and as uh, Mr. Islam mentioned, we'll try to make sure you stay awake. Um, so the, but the session topic is extremely important for Bangladesh. Um, we're looking at how infrastructure is an important part of the ability for Bangladesh to realize its potential. First, um, overall, not specific to Bangladesh, but for any developing country, or developed countries for that matter, infrastructure is key to competitiveness and to economic development. It's really the bedrock of uh, enhancing welfare, creating jobs, and providing for more sustained, uh, inclusive growth. And South Asia has become now one of the fastest growing regions globally, so we're all lucky to be based here if, if we were assigned here, or lucky to be born here if you were born here. We see that according to the World Competitiveness Report and the World Economic Forum, um, South Asia is one of the fastest growing regions. But we can also see that there is significant gaps in infrastructure quantity and quality when we compare to even other developing countries. Um, we are very, uh, you know, honored to have uh, a representative from ADB, and I am say, using a number of both ADB uh, statistics and World Bank statistics during my presentation. But one to start off with is a citing ADB, a, a study published just a couple years ago uh, in 2017 shows that the region as a whole in South Asia needs approximately $5.5 billion of investment in infrastructure. And this slide gives you an idea of what the allocation of those needs are, just looking at where we have gaps in the infrastructure uh, capabilities in the region. We, Turning specifically to Bangladesh, um, we all know that Bangladesh has been one of Asia's most remarkable success stories, but we're often not telling our story loud enough or in a more, in a more coherent manner. So that's what one of our objectives obviously today and in many of such sessions. We see that the growth figures continue to be very healthy and positive in the 7% range, although the target for all of us is to be reaching a higher, even higher level of economic growth. We have now surpassed China in GDP growth numbers, and Bangladesh is on track to become about the 28th largest economy in the world by around 2030. 
But all that said, um, infrastructure really could become a deterrent in our ability to reach those targets. Um, I'm using a, the slide of the world competitiveness uh, inf um, framework, and you can see in this sort of circular graph where we have strengths in Bangladesh and where we have weaknesses. So uh, infrastructure, um, as well as technological readiness, uh, is one of the areas where Bangladesh is weaker than other countries and where we really need to focus our attention in order to make sure we can meet these growth objectives. Overall, we have a need for approximately $320 billion of infrastructure investment in the next uh, basically 12 to 15 years in Bangladesh. And that will require a significantly higher proportion of GDP to be uh, invested in infrastructure. Right now, um, Bangladesh has only invested around 1.8% of GDP in infrastructure. And we can see, based on economists' projections, that the requirement would be closer to 6 to 8% of GDP. Now, throughout this presentation, I will use percent of GDP as a way to kind of norm across uh, larger and smaller GDP um, uh, countries. And, uh, for example, in India and in Vietnam, the investment of infrastructure is more than 5% of GDP. And where is all of this funds going to come from? Now, I'm always saying, many of you have heard me speak before, and I say it many times, that money is not the problem in Bangladesh. Well, you say, that's a lot of money, Wendy, $320 billion. Are we really going to be able to find that? Well, FDI, I think, is one of the main areas where we should be focusing our attention how to mobilize the right kind of FDI in the sectors where we need foreign capital, foreign expertise, and innovation. FDI in Bangladesh today is about 0.86% of GDP, less than 1%. In India, it's around 3% of GDP. Thailand, around 2 Vietnam, more than 6%. And we have the government's own targets on GDP, on, on uh, FDI, are to have more than $9.5 billion in GDP by 2020. Right now, we are nowhere near that target, and we really need to focus that, that FDI increase on the critical areas of infrastructure. Um, looking forward, where do we really need these billions of dollars to flow? looking at high potential and important sectors of the economy that will drive the kind of growth that we need um, in the industrial and commercial and services sectors. One of them is obviously power, and we're very uh, you know, honored to have uh, the former Secretary of Power who will be able to provide much deeper expertise about the history of how we have developed in this sector. Um, but we do need significant um, continued investment in generation. Generation has been a, has been a high success um, sector for Bangladesh, and I'll talk a little bit about more it later. But con generation investment is continued area of requirements. But transmission and distribution is probably even more important in how to make sure that that generation is reaching uh, the ultimate consumers and is done in an efficient manner. The industrial sector is one of the, is the leading consumer of electricity, obviously, and that is an area where we need to make sure that electricity quality and quantity is meeting the needs of the, of the driving force in the economy. The power master plan for uh, the government, from the government, targets uh, universal electrification by 2021, and actually I think this is ahead of target. So we will be having universal electrification for all the people in Bangladesh, which is an excellent target and is, ensures that there is inclusive uh, benefit to electrification. Now the, now the targets are to reach more than uh, 30,000 megawatts of installed generation by 2030, which is not too far in the future, and 60,000 megawatts by 2040. So the pace of generation, in, in installed generation growth in Bangladesh needs to continue at least at where it's, go it's gone so far and increase in the future. An important part of that is renewable generation and clean fuels. So we need to look also at the climate impacts of how Bangladesh is generating its power and how we can fund that both from international foreign sources as well as domestic uh, funding sources. Particularly in the power space where we have a proven 
a proven government-backed PPA, and we have proven local, local developers. Um, we feel in IFC, and I feel across the sector, that um, increasingly we can see more alternatives on uh, financing longer term in local currency and over the years by 2040 let's say we should be shifting to a different mix of a US de dollar denominated tariff and local currency do dollar denominated tariff this is a trend that I think will happen across Asia and in all developing markets particularly um, alternatives that we see uh, here are for instance a local currency denominated bonds in overseas markets as well to tap new sources of financing and we need to see greater use of technology and smart grid technologies for instance in the power space a couple of other very important areas of infrastructure where we have a significant need for investment um, some were mentioned in the previous uh, sessions, for sure, and I don't think we'll have too much uh, debate. The question is more how do we make sure that we're addressing the logistics and the enabling infrastructure, particularly in ports, airports, and in roads. So how do we get where we're going, and how do we get our goods into and out of Bangladesh? Um, there is a significant amount of concentration of population and our flow of goods and services in Bangladesh. Um, the, uh, the airport here in Dhaka handles approximately 75% of all domestic uh, or all passenger demand and more than 90% of total cargo demand. So we have a significant concentration risk in the airport just there and we need to make sure that that airport works as efficiently as possible. We can see already that the government's own uh, civil aviation's master plan and JICA study forecasts around 24 million passengers and a significant increase in the metric tons of cargo um, just by 20, 2035. So we need to make sure that the, the airport can handle that increase in traffic. Similarly, the Chittagong port is a high concentration for in, in larger um, uh, shipments and in a handles 92% of maritime trade. Uh, we already know that the, the delays at Chirgong port are a significant challenge for uh, particularly the key export sectors in Bangladesh. So together, those logistics space of airports and ports need approximately $7.5 million billion of investment. And finally, I've turned to an area of, of roads. Now, we've already seen quite a few large road projects that are coming through the PPP office, I think Officer Bai is here to, and can maybe illuminate us on, on the progress, but this is clearly a high priority for both uh, everyday citizens and for the commercial and industrial sector. The, the Accident Research Institute of Buet estimates that there's more than $3 billion in losses annually due to traffic congestion, and we all know that the average speed in Dhaka is extremely slow, but the statistics uh, bear it out. It's around seven kilometers per hour. You can probably walk faster than you can drive most of the time in Dhaka. So clearly, we need to address uh, the need for road infrastructure. Bangladesh is not a large geographic area, and if we can have more efficient roads, then we can also ensure that everyone can um, in, have better jobs and to expand their commercial opportunities. And the final two areas I want to discuss are economic zones and also water. I think one of the things at uh, lunch we were discussing about both the benefits of developing our economy based on ready-made garments, but also the costs to ready-made garments. And one of those costs has been some, uh, the, the, the cost on the environment. So the water situation in Bangladesh is obviously critical. It's critical to uh, Bangladesh as a delta country. It's critical to Bangladesh's industry as well. There are more than 400 billion liters of, of wastewater produced by various industrial sectors. And the level of uh, environmental um, compliance is, fairly, is quite low across the overall sector. This has impacted groundwater. It has impacted um, the ability for um, industries to increase their value addition into export markets as well. But the water situation also impacts everyday people. Less than 15% of people in Bangladesh have access to clean drinking water, which is quite a shocking statistic. 
So the, the investment needed in water, both wastewater, water supply, uh, also even um, uh, trans transportation and the deltas, that is another area that needs significant amount of, of work. Finally, we've, we've all been familiar with the government's push on economic zones, which is uh, really probably a culmination of all the, the questions that I just put on the table of each of these sectors. So economic zones are a way to solve many of these problems in a concentrated area, to address the issues of logistics, to address power, to address utility, availability, efficiency, and improve overall environmental standards um, in a way that can maximize and diversify the export economy. We've already seen more than $2.9 billion of investments made in economic zones, and there's been quite a bit of progress. We have uh, pre-qualification licenses for private zones. Around 17 pre-qualification licenses have been issued, and six private sector zones have started operations. We see some global developers very interested in economic zones in Bangladesh, and we also see local uh, private de zone developers are leading to successes, uh, like Abdul Monim's uh, attraction of Honda as a manufacturer. So, I would look to um, other countries as examples of how we can maximize each one of the, these sectors and make the most of it for the overall economy of Bangladesh. So the question is, how do we close all these gaps? Um, I, I used two examples, uh, one being India and one being China. Uh, those are kind of you know, stereotypical examples, but still the numbers are fairly shocking. But it's not only India and China that can give us examples. Um, uh, a study out of the uh, Australian Department for Foreign Affairs and Trade, um, looking at the entire Asia Pacific region, um, noted that the role of the private sector is extremely important when developing infrastructure and also in reduction of poverty and job creation. The private sector investment across Asia Pacific in the last 15 years has created 90% of the jobs and funds around 60% of all infrastructure investments. And it provides approximately 80% of government revenues. So focusing on how private sector can be mobilized to provide the services, the infrastructure, and the quality of life that we want is the most important question for Bangladesh. I'll go quickly through examples from China, and I think some of the numbers are really quite amazing. I mean, we've all heard about China uh, in many examples, but looking at some of the comparisons of how much uh, investment is going into uh, infrastructure and private investment really puts a contrast. So I said that I was going to use percentage of GDP so we don't have to worry about the billions and trillions of GDP, uh, but 44% of uh, GDP is investment in infrastructure and that even in China which we often think of now as an outward investor has 168 billion dollars in FDI in 2017 so continuing the focus on high quality infrastructure is even going on in China and I think many of you who have visited China in recent years can see this um, clearly in addition although China has a large public sector the private sector employs uh, more than 40% of the population. So that is the real driver of innovation and new ideas. And India may not be seen normally as the perfect example in this case, but India has been doing a lot more in mobilizing private investment in infrastructure over the last years. India has invested approximately $64 billion in infrastructure just in the last five years. And they've also addressed significantly the business environment to make sure that they can attract the right type of FDI. They've jumped 30 places in the ease of doing business uh, rankings in last year from 130 to 100. And this uh, obviously garnered them a lot of positive attention from investors. They've also, they're also ranked quite highly in the World Economic Forum competitive index at 40. And they are really, even though they're not necessarily meeting the growth rates that we are always, they are really posed to become one of the largest nations, uh, largest GDPs by 2050. 
And their FDI is uh, at least more than double what uh, the FDI is here in Bangladesh. We're looking at 3% of GDP, which is still fairly low in the scope of things. So these two examples are, are ones that we should take advantage of and think about. Thinking broadly across all of South Asia, I just would like to also highlight that Bangladesh has not been able to uh, maximize its attraction of FDI, particularly in infrastructure. So looking just at private sector participation in infrastructure over South Asia, there's been around $223 billion of investment um, taking across the entire uh, SARC region. Um, Bangladesh is in the top three, but India and Pakistan have a much greater percentage of private sector uh, investment in infrastructure than does Bangladesh. So we need to look how we can shift those numbers to really take advantage of the quality uh, investors that are looking to come to Bangladesh. But as I mentioned before, we do have some excellent examples. So I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on on what we've done well, um, but I do think that it provides an excellent framework to think about how can we transition from Bangladesh's success uh, in both power and also I would say telecoms to use that same idea of mobilizing the private sector in other sectors like airports, roads, and um, transmission. In Bangladesh, uh, power, power uh, transformation over the last uh, 10 to 15 years was very much driven by the private sector. Uh, the growth in the installed generation um, was, I think, phenomenal, obviously. And now we can see that we're very close to having 100% of the population with access to power. Now the private sector has accounted for approximately 60% of installed capacity here in Bangladesh. And this provides an excellent example of how to use independent power and private sector to uh, mobilize uh, benefits for the people. The second area I would highlight is the telecom sector. Um, Bangladesh obviously has a very high penetration rate of mobile services and increasing now moving into 4G um, access to mobile internet. There are more than 80 million uh, subscribers to mobile internet, and you can see many people that just leapfrog straight. They've never used the internet much on an actual desktop computer. The phone is how they know the internet. Um, and again, this was driven by the private sector um, and the private sector operators. So um, to conclude, uh, a few points that I'd like to put forward for the panel's um, thoughts and discussions. I think that we have many good examples in each of these, uh, each of these subsectors on how countries have taken their challenges and brought in the best private uh, investors to make the most of their assets. I think I may have talked about this example before to some of these audiences, so I do apologize, but um, one of the examples we often use about airports is an uh, airport in uh, the Philippines. Uh, it's the Mastan Cebu Airport. And the reason we talk about it is because it was the size of Dhaka Airport uh, when they started to look at how they should expand investment um, in 2014. And in the Philippines, the government decided to go with a PPP approach. Um, and what was amazing about this uh, PPP project was that the project resulted in a brand new airport that, provide, that gave um, at least double the passenger uh, capacity and it resulted in revenues to the government. So the government actually didn't have to spend any money to improve this critical asset. And PPPs that are involving a critical asset like a port or an airport um, generally don't require actually m too much material outlays from the government. But it's important to set um, standards and to set a competitive process to make sure that you're getting the best deal um, from the right developers. I'd also highlight an example um, where IFC um, financed a toll road in Senegal, and this was recently closed just last year. Um, the, the toll road actually reduced the time of traffic and t transit times by 75%. So I'd just like us to keep that in our head, think of reducing our traffic time 75% and what we would do with the time in our day if we could do that here in Dhaka or even between Dhaka and Silet or Dhaka and Chittagong. 
to, to do those things, we need to diversify the types of financing that we have, uh, financing tools that we utilize here, and think differently about the multitude of types of foreign direct investment and domestic investment structures that we can use in each of these subsectors. I've highlighted the example of public-private partnerships, which is an excellent way to go about uh, investment from the private sector. But direct investment, whether it be foreign or domestic, is important. And utilizing strong operations and maintenance contracts can also be a way to uh, improve service delivery with your current assets. And one of the things I don't want to uh, impinge on the next uh, panel's uh, topics, but we need to also expand the financial products and uh, diversification here in Bangladesh, looking at both equity, um, quasi-equity mezzanine structures, as well as the tenor and the currency of debt processes. And we need to expand um, bond and, and debt offerings outside of straight bank loan type of, uh, type of uh, interactions in, um, in the bond space. So I think this uh, lays out, I hope, some of our challenges, but also where we can see that Bangladesh has made very strong uh, strides and achievements in the past. And the question I guess I put to our panel is how do we um, utilize the strengths of Bangladesh and really these assets and opportunities of our huge and growing market and our strategic location to mobilize the right type of financing and the right type of infrastructure for all the people of Bangladesh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wendy, your masterly articulated address brilliantly tells the basic concern of Bangladesh. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Wendy Jo Werner is no doubt put her case with force. She has shown the great fairness in her paper, in her advocacy, and has made the points very, very carefully about the Bangladesh scenario. Thank you, Wendy. I would like to convey my personal appreciation for the vast knowledge she has put at our disposal this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, at this point in time, let me invite uh, Mr. Nishan Kumar, uh, Executive Director of Asia in Singapore, to share his valuable thought Mr. Kumar, the floor is yours, and you will have five to six minutes time. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank Michel. You, Thank you. I don't have a presentation, so I can keep so it. So nobody will distract their eyes I'm from you. Yeah, no, I, I, <laughs> I, I, I was told it was, it was, it was yes, a panel Yes, it is. Right. I saw people speaking, so I scribbled something. So I very good. Sense, you know, when nobody will distract their eyes yes, from you. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> Thank you. Respected chair, uh, respected uh, speakers, um, President DCCI, members of DCCI, um, policy makers, industrialists, banking and finance professionals from home and abroad. Absolutely delighted to be here. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Now, <clears throat> coming to my, my speech, if I may say so, I've been hearing terms like long-term financing, local currency financing, institutional capital, Capital mobilization, all music to my ears. And, and I'll, 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 in, a, in a short while, I'll tell you why. Um, first, let me tell you who, who I am and who, uh, who, whom I work for, and which will give you a perspective. So we, I mean, I work for Grandco. We are basically a developmental finance institution, or a DFI, owned by five of the G12 governments. Government of the UK, through DFID, is one of the largest funding providers. And the others are uh, Netherlands through FMO, um, uh, Sweden, Switzerland, and Australia. Uh, we were set up in 2006 to act as catalyst for channeling long-term financing in local currency across emerging markets of Africa, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and the Pacific. Um, we, we are essentially unconditional, irrevocable, on-demand credit guarantee providers uh, for bank financing and, and capital market instruments for infrastructure projects. Um, 
So that's in short about Garanko. One of my bosses is, is also speaking later, so he can he can add uh, uh, more about it. Um, now, uh, now, you know, I, w what exactly is needed to to foster private sector investment into 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 Bangladesh? I don't think I need to. Uh, give five or six or ten points ab uh, about all of, I mean, about this, this topic. I think it has been addressed a lot since morning, and the speakers going forward would also talk about it. I would rather like to give some examples. Um, you know, I live in Singapore. Um, population of Singapore is six million. Um, does, can anyone tell me how, what is the power capacity of Singapore, or what is the generation in Singapore? Mm, 17 or 18 gigawatt, roughly. Uh, population of Bangladesh, I don't think I need to tell that, you know. Um, what is the generation capacity? I mean, so the, the, you, you have one evidence there to show the massive potential. Another example is take your neighbors, um, India. Uh, 16, Bangladesh has 16% of the population of India and 4% of the size of India, four times as densely populated. So there is enough potential. I don't think we need to talk about potential. It's about, it, it's about how to unlock this potential. I mean, I was, I was talking to Wendy uh, after lunch. You know, I mean, I was once a science student, and, and we, talk, we love to talk about potential energy, right? But this potential will be meaningless if we don't convert this potential into kinetic energy, right? And how do we do that? Uh, you know, or what's, what's exactly the problem? Now, one of the things that I have noticed since I started coming to Bangladesh is, it's, I, I've seen Bangladeshis, and, and please, I mean, I call spade a spade, so please bear with me. Bangladeshis need to believe in their resources and abilities. You know, communication is key. And, and that is something I found quite strange. I mean, we, we, we helped finance the first ever grid-connected solar project in Bangladesh. Uh, structure, first ever 15-year loan in Bangladesh um, for, for infrastructure project. And when I took this project to my board, I was asked, tell me one thing, how, since how long have you been going to Bangladesh? You consider yourself to be an expert when their own banking institutions are not willing to fund their project. Why is that the case? Is, it, is the problem the PPA? Is problem the implementation? Is problem the land? Is problem the entire ecosystem? So, you know, I mean, this is, this is, this is uh, you know, this, this is a, uh, these are some of the questions that, that I've been facing. And now, you know, and, and also about communication. I think Wendy also touched upon that, and, and some speakers in, um, earlier during the day touched upon communication. Communication is key. You need to tell what, what opportunities the country actually um, uh, provides. You know, I mean, there are some infrastructure funds who are based out of Singapore. I've been telling them, let's go and, and find opportunities together in Bangladesh. You know, th there are those funds who are sitting there with with billions of dollars of cash and, and spending years and years in some of the illustrious Southeast Asian countries and still not being able to move ahead in their, in their investment process. When I tell them about Bangladesh, they start saying, mm, Bangladesh, you know. So I tell them, look, I'm not asking you to go to Mars. It's Bangladesh for Christ's sake. Let, let's go there and we, you, you'll see for yourself. And, and, and that is what and that's happening because of the lack of communication, because the country is not able to communicate what are the opportunities that it actually possesses and, and can provide to investors and, and financiers. You know, <clears throat> so it's not, it's not like the, you know, it, it, there are problems, uh, problems galore here. There are, uh, I mean, I, I've been quite impressed by certain policy making and, and, and decisions that was, that was uh, done, especially during, again, during the solar project, uh, this, this Tecna solar project, um, by the chairman, when, when, when I met uh, uh, Kazi Amin, sir, he told, you know, if as long as your financing structure makes sense 
and is beneficial to country's financing system, we shall support it. And, and um, you know, and he, he's, he's, uh, he's today one of the biggest uh, admirers of this structure that we have actually implemented in the country. And we hope that we replicate it across other projects. Now, <clears throat> coming to, um, uh, you know, what exactly or, or what, what steps that we can actually take uh, in order to unlock this, this potential. Uh, I won't go into number of steps. I would rather go into the lowest hanging fruit, according to me, um, which, uh, which uh, you know, if we are able to harvest that well, then it can provide quick and tangible benefit uh, in channeling private sector investment into, into, in all, uh, into infrastructure projects here. And that is uh, development of a vibrant bond market in the country. You know, I, I, in, during one of my meetings with uh, Mr. A.K. Khan, uh, we were discussing what, what's exactly preventing countries' financial system into, or banks into investing in projects here or lending for projects. You know, it's, it's, capacity is a, is, is a big issue. And I, when I asked about, what about the insurance companies here? You know, the provident fund here. What, what's happening there? You know, why aren't they investing? And, and, and he smiled and he said, you know, where are they investing? They are investing in government securities. They are buying land, sitting on land, and, 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 and uh, you know, that's how they are managing their liability, which is quite strange. Now, uh, the country has a, has a Zakat fund. And, and uh, you know, I, I think he also gave me a data point that, uh, um, few, I mean, eight or ten years ago, uh, when the stu study was done last, um, the, the contribution of Zakat fund, or collection in Zakat fund was more than the tax collection. It shows people fear mo God more than, than, than the government. But that's fine, you know, I mean, if you are able to mobilize the Zakat fund into investment in infrastructure, you know, and, and, and for the benefit of people, you are going to unlock a, 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 a great piece of, of um, uh, a great source to, uh, um, you know, for, for this purpose. Um, there are around 65, 70 odd insurance companies in the country. You know, if we are able to unlock even 10% of their capital into, into uh, bond market, that's going to be massive. Uh, so, and, 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 and uh, to, to, force, uh, to ensure that it gets done with uh, DCCI, we are, we, are, we are doing a bond market study for country and uh, hopefully we'll, we're, we're in, you know, we'll be able to demonstrate what are exactly the steps that are needed and who are the institutions that need to be targeted in order to channel their money into uh, funding infrastructure for, uh, projects in the country. So that is, that is my speech. That's it. I hope it made sense. Thank, Thank you, you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Nishant Kumar, for enriching us with your international ex expertise, and especially the, the fund that you have mentioned. We agree to all the points, but about Zakat fund that you have touched upon, uh, that's, I, th I think some question will be coming from the floor when we declare the opening of the floor. At this point, of, thank, you, thank you, Mr. Nishan Kumar. Ladies and gentlemen, at this point in time, let me invite Dr. Salim Rahan, the professor of the Dhaka University and executive director of South Asian Network on Economic Modeling, Sanem, a young Bangladeshi academician and researcher with international exposure. Now, I am welcoming Dr. Salim Rahan to place his valuable uh, inputs. Please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that uh, the microphone is working. Uh, I must thank uh, the keynote presenter, Ms. Warner, I think, for her excellent presentation. And after that presentation, I was thinking, actually, what to say more. Uh, because she, she highlighted the major points. She mentioned those numbers, uh, which are very important. And also, uh, towards the end, uh, kind of uh, showed us, you know, the ways why, how Bangladesh can actually uh, explore the possibilities of financing the infrastructural gap investment. Uh, so I thought that probably not to repeat uh, what, uh, you know, has been discussed so far. Probably I can touch upon some of the issues which are also very important when we talk about infrastructure investment. 
uh, and also private sector engagement because in many of the discussions I found that I find that actually those issues are kind of ignored uh, first if I start with that uh, the point that probably it's my understanding that there's a serious market failure in infrastructure investment especially it's not that the private sector would come automatically that to invest in this market so here there is a role of the public sector is very very important and when I say the public sector's role and the public sector has to be very dynamic, not to be a very old-fashioned public sector. So I think there is a very clear need for the change in the mindset of the public sector in Bangladesh, how they deal with the private sector and engage them in this large, this huge resource requirement, as uh, uh, Ms. Warner, she has rightly pointed out, how to engage the private sector, how to get the best out of them. And probably we can pose the question, I'd really like to hear from the audience too, the, very relevant people who are here today and also from the panels. Why has the PPP not been very successful so far in Bangladesh? Have we learned really, really from the countries who have succeeded in doing so? So that's my first point. Second point, probably we don't really talk much, but that is something very, very important. It's not only the spending. We can talk about quite a lot, like 5% of GDP is needed for infrastructure investment, five to six, maybe more. Actually, the last year, the UNSCAP report from Bangkok, they came up with the suggestion that probably we need around 10% of GDP for infrastructure investment. But it's not about only the spending, but the quality of spending is very, very important. Because the efficiency of the spending or the infrastructure investment, that is also a big question mark when you see the experience in Bangladesh. When you see that the time actually increases, cost escalation, and actually we can't finish the project within the time frame. So how do you solve this problem? Here, you know, I think probably we open up a lot of issues, what we really need to discuss. So I think definitely the numbers are in front of us. We can see those big, big numbers, but behind those numbers, there are many more interesting stories and many more challenges we need to solve. My third point is that uh, the management of the infrastructural issues are very, very important. The infrastructural facilities. So it's not only the hard infrastructure, we have to invest quite a lot on the soft infrastructure, the human capital. And also there I can see that there is a huge market failure. It's not that uh, the private sector has come a long way or very, very enthusiastically to invest on developing the human capital or the skilled labor force. I think here comes the how kind of incentives the public sector or the government is providing and how this public-private partnership is really working well to get this right kind of human capital in the market. We can talk a lot about that 100 special economic zone by 2030. We can have big, big economic zone, but who would operate them? Are we then uh, planning to rely on the foreign expertise? You know, so I think this is something, a big issue, big question mark. We need to solve, and I think unless and until we combine this hard infrastructure with the soft infrastructure in a very efficient way, I think uh, probably we'll get one part of the story right, but the other part would tell the whole story completely uh, failure. My final point, I, am, I was looking at my watch too, my final point is that more of an institutional issue. I actually wrote an article a couple of years back and then I was really looking into the whole issue of what I call uh, the entitlement failure in infrastructure. Uh, you remember, you can definitely recall uh, Nobel laureate Professor Amorto Sen's this entitlement failure uh, uh, idea that you can have uh, one who was describing this famine, he was saying that it's not the shortage of food in the market, it is actually the access to food, the entitlement. You can have actually a supply of food. Actually, actually when Amartya Sen he was exploring those famine, and he was saying that it was not the shortage of food which, which was creating the famine. It was people's access to food. They had serious entitlement failure. So if I apply that concept in the uh, infra infrastructure, we can actually have a large supply of infrastructure, but still we, we may find there are many, many sectors are not being able to enjoy the benefit of the infrastructure they are actually having the problem of entitlement failure. I'll give you one example. We can have big, big flyovers, but unless and until we get our sh short and small roads well-developed and connected to those flyovers, who will actually get into those flyovers? 
who will enjoy the benefit of those flyovers. We can actually develop our port, Chittagong port, definitely we need that. We can have an expressway between Dhaka and Chittagong, but unless and until we can solve the relocation of tannery from Hajaribar to Savar efficiently, the problem of CTP efficiently, and we get this uh, tannery estate efficiently run, we can't expect that the, labor ex the leather export would increase from $1 billion to $5 billion by 2020. So I think we need to think, take a step back and understand the whole institutional arrangement behind how we can get this private sector engaged more efficiently in solving this big challenge when, and I, I can tell you that we have very short time. You know, if we really want to achieve 2030 development agenda, it's only 12 years uh, we have. And probably it's not, we can't think that we'll solve all the problem by 20, uh, we'll leave all the problems to solve by the, uh, the last year of 2030. It's not possible. We have to take steps now. We have to plan, we have to sequence our uh, agenda and then see what we can do you know, in the, within the short term by 2025 and by 2030. With this, I'd like to end here. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Salim. We are really you are really enlightened by your research, by your experience, and the, by the uh, the way you have expounded the subjects here. And I hope we will take it home. We'll go really wiser. And with this word, I thank you once again for your personal experiences that you have shared today. Now, ladies and gentlemen, at this point in time. Let us invite an experienced bureaucrat, the policymaker, reformer, and the planner of Bangladesh power sector development, the former secretary, M. Faisal, Khan, Faisal Kubir Khan. Please guide, guide us through your experience. Dr. Khan is an outstanding speaker. Thank you. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'll tell you a few stories. As some of you know, I have been involved in uh, uh, what you call developing uh, private sector infrastructure over the last uh, 20 years or so, uh, initially as the founder CEO of ITCOL. So, uh, first of all, everybody is saying that, yes, uh, there's no question that pri private sector has to be involved. But the question is why we are unable to get private sector involved. The first uh, difficulties in our planning process. In those days, in 1998-99, so I, I used to go to, I've, I, was the, I, was, I was in charge of this new institution, so I would visit, visit senior bureaucrats and then say that, I said we should have private sector in the uh, infrastructure business. So one day I, uh, I was called by the then secretary, uh, sorry, the then member programming of the Planning Commission. He was an alumni of the same university from where I graduated. So he said, uh, Fozul, you have lots of lots of projects for private sector implementation. Also, I was encouraged and then I immediately uh, went to his office. So he gave me a list of 200 projects. He said, these are earmarks for private sector implementation. So what are these projects? Some dam somewhere some uh, sanitation project in some rural areas. So what the, he has, they have basically done is that, so the government, present government planning processes, so if there is a donor financing, some donors are here, I'll, I'll be, be with them. So they have to take the blame. So if there's some donor financing is available for a project, the project is earmarked for, for implementation under donor financing. So if there is, a, if is a, no donor financing available, if there is some uh, public resource available, then allocate it to public resource. So then uh, that list of that, that for which there was no, what you call donor financing, there was no public resource available, was left for well, what you call a public sector implementation. So I told uh, Dr. Frey this, sir, something that was not attractive enough to the donors, something that was not attractive to the government. Why do you think uh, the private sector would be crazy enough to take those projects? So we really need to address that issue there. First issue that we need to address is to, we have to rejig our, what you call, uh, planning process. 
It should be the other way around. We should have the projects that could be implemented by private sector. That has to be taken first. And then, you know, there are other projects uh, th that the private sector cannot do or are not willing to do. Those should be given for what you call a donor financing or what you call uh, private sector finance. And also we need to reconstitute public finance, uh, what you call the planning commission. There is no private sector representative there. So is there all uh, civil servants? There are some ministers and of course some of them are uh, what you call businessmen. So, but that deal doesn't have. We really need to reconstitute the, what you call, uh, uh, the, our, rejig our whole uh, planning process. Now coming to the next year, I did a study recently on infrastructure financing on behalf of ADB. I hope ADB country director would permit to uh, divulge some of the findings that I had. So I went to, we went to all the top businessmen, uh, uh, Apex, uh, what do you call it, Square, you name it, where people having 200, 300, 500 million dollars of investment. So we asked them very simple questions. Do you have any investment in infrastructure? Yes or no? So if you're yes, you're in one category. If you're no, in, uh, then you're in what do you call it, another category. Then I asked, uh, why don't you invest in, uh, what do you call it? So, so, so if you said yes, in which sector? And obviously you all have guessed. It is in the, what do you call it, power generation. So then we said, okay, fine. Then the question is, why don't you invest in other sectors? He said that for the power sector, there is a business model. So I know that what my revenues are. I know my costs are. So I know my, what my bottom line is. So, uh, after I please feel free to stop me. Yeah. These are stories, okay. so I can stop at any, any yes. point. You, you have three more minutes. Okay, all right. All right. So, so, I know my bottom line. So I can, I have taken this project. But there is no comparable bottom, what you call, business model for what you call for a road project, for example, for an airport project, for a what you call port project. So, so that's one, one issue. Then, uh, so this is, these are people who are having uh, investment in infrastructure, particularly power generation. Then I ask people who, I said, you have investment in oil refineries, these, that, pharmaceutical, textile, but why don't you invest? So money is money, you know, you could, you could make, make money in, uh, by investing in fact, why don't you do that? So there, you know, uh, again, uh, there are these issues of, the main issue that came out is of what you call, number of issues actually came out. Uh, first thing was what you call transparency of the procurement process. So we have uh, two types of uh, businessmen. We have politically linked businessmen and then entrepreneurial businessmen. So obviously entrepreneurial businessmen do not get into the process because the process is not transparent. I'll again tell you another story. So, uh, so we are doing this uh, uh, power plant projects. We did AES megawatt, 450 megawatt power plant. So we thought that we diversified into what you call port sector, which was another uh, critical area. So there was a project, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman will recall, there was a foreign investment by an SSAB uh, for a container terminal uh, project. But the procurement process was so flawed that the court uh, turned it down. We are supposed to invest uh, $60 million in that project. So that's, so what you call for the, to get the private sector, what you call transparency is a very, very important issue. Let me give you another example. So we could not do this uh, project, but we had another, uh, what you call, two small land pro uh, port project in what you call Panama and uh, Shonamashti in the north of, uh, north of Bangladesh. So we did the project, we had what you call, financial close. I looked at the financial model. It was very, very robust. The debt service cover ratio, 2.2, 2.3, 2.4. And then after financing, the guy was not repaying us. I said, what is happening? And we looked at the year. In fact, the number of trusts coming were more than we, we built in the model. We plugged the new numbers. The debt service cover issue goes over above three. But the guy was not paying. So I called the guy for a quiet discussion, the sponsor, private sponsor of the project. So he gave the analogy of a chicken. He said that the, what do you call, the breast, the thigh, the leg of this project has been eaten by the, uh, what do you call, 
uh, minister and the secretary, secretary. So what I am left is the left of the rest of the uh, project. So transparency, transparency is a very, very big issue. So in India, if you look at Tata, is there Reliance is there? Everybody is in such a sector, but none of our very top, what you call a businessmen, are in infrastructure sector. The, our big challenge would be to what you call get them into, into infrastructure infrastructure business. The other thing is, uh, Wendy has cited power se sector as an example. You see, power sector is an example, but it's also deterring investment in other sectors, I would argue. Let me tell you why. Because you have created an over-incentive uh, regime. It is high time that we abandon this IPP model. Way back in uh, 2000, uh, 2007 or 8, I spent what you got, I burnt midnight candles to develop this market power policy. Because this is so sweet. Nobody goes through that, that way. And because of this, you know, people, people are not in, in, invested in other sectors. Everybody is in power. Everybody is in power and power generation, not transmission, not distribution. So this, what you call, uh, uh, what you call the success of power sector is also what you call uh, uh, is a different in uh, what you call private sector, uh, private sector participation in other sectors. Could okay, so and then the, I'll just stop. I'll just stop it now. I'll just stop it now. The last thing is uh, we are uh, we really need to we are a convert into the what you call uh, private sector development, but we really really have to have to really accept it. Uh, but uh, that has not really happened because still our infrastructure is a source of what you call political party financing and what you call politician financing. So that has to be stopped uh, to get the, what you call, uh, truly, what you call a, a private sector-led uh, growth of infrastructure in Bangladesh. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Khan. Dr. Faisal Khan, this is wonderful. You have given a practical experience. I have a lot of practical experience in the, in the context of this country, and thank you for focusing on the subject. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we have the last designated discussant. Uh, I would like to now invite Professor Dr. Naoki Yoshimu. Dean of Dean and Chief Executive Officer of Asian Development Bank Institute of ADB Institute to share his research based international experience with us. Mr. Yashumo. Thank you very much. I have prepared my slides and I'd like to start from uh, talking about infrastructure investment into three aspects. Okay, first, uh, uh, in my slides, it shows the circulation of domestic savings is very important. And first one is bank deposits and life insurance and pension funds. And those are the sources of finance in infrastructure. Especially Bangladesh is growing society. And only bank deposits is not enough. Bank deposits are short term, one year, three years. But life insurance is 10 years and 20 years. So life insurance is very important, and pension funds have to be grown because aging population in future. Then those long-term investments are needing for investment. Then infrastructure is one of the best places for those long-term investment will go in. However, infrastructure, rate of returns are usually very low. I have another slide, but it is not shown. And infrastructure is usually, revenue comes from user charges. Electric power, water, those prices have to be very low. Then private sectors are impossible to get in. That is why public-private partnerships are not going to very well. Because user charges used to be the only sources of revenue. 
However, electric power supply will create big spillover effects. Electric power supply will create new jobs. Agricultural farmers can use tractors. Their productivity will go up. So infrastructure can create big spillover effects, and property values will go up, and business corporate profit goes up. And then there's the incremental tax revenues coming from infrastructure investment. However, those tax revenues all went to the government. That is market failure, externality. Infrastructure can create big external effect. However, it was not returned to infrastructure investors. So best way is to measure how much tax revenue increased based on each infrastructure. Econometrics, there's a method called difference in difference method. Then we can compute each infrastructure, how much it contributed to the increase of tax revenue. Then, for example, 50% of those tax revenues were returned to infrastructure investors. Then, by looking at various countries, sometimes rate of return goes up 40%. Sometimes rate of return goes up to 60%. And those increment goes on 10 years, 20 years, as long as infrastructure goes well. Then, lots of private investors can come in. So insurance and pension funds can invest into infrastructure. One of the typical examples is in Vietnam. They started pension funds, but internally there is no instrument they can invest. So they started to invest into U.S. bond market. But on the other hand, Vietnam needs huge amount of infrastructure. Then they started to borrow money from abroad. But they could have used domestic insurance pension funds to circulate it within the country. If the rate of return from infrastructures were very high, then they could circulate it. And in Philippines, they are now, Minister Dominguez understood my idea. So he's going to capture those spillover tax revenues and bring it back to infrastructure investment. I hope the first project is between Clark Airport and Manila City. And they are planning to have railway. And if my method can be utilized, then tax revenue, extra tax revenue, can be returned to the infrastructure investors. That can bring lots of long-term infrastructure investors. And two more additional comments about infrastructure. One is infrastructure together with education will create much higher spillover effects. I used 44 country United Nations data. Then secondary school education and university education has a positive impact together with the infrastructure. That can create much higher spillover effects. Secondary school is ordinary skills and university is special skills. And those two became very significant in econometrics. And this infrastructure can apply not only electricity, but also roads and highways. And one more point is about small businesses and startup businesses. In Cambodia, Vietnam, ladies want to start their own small restaurant, small shop along the road. But banks could not lend money to those startup businesses. So what we started in Japan originally was hometown crowdfunding. People in the region, 250 people, contributed a small amount of money for one lady to start their business. In Vietnam, 40 ladies want to start their own restaurant shops along the station. And all those money comes from crowdfunding, hometown investment trust funds from the region. Then that has created another speed of effects for small businesses. Lastly, land to capture is very difficult, including Japan. Japan wanted to have fast train. Then small piece of land, 24 people came, relatives and fathers, and everyone said, this piece of land is mine. And it took so many years to la purchase land. And what we started in Japan is a land trust. We make let those people own their own land. We don't need to purchase those land. You can keep the land as it is. But please lease the land to infrastructure company. So 24 landowners can keep the land. 
but they receive annual lease and rent every year. And it became much better. Traditionally, agricultural farmers received huge amount of money by selling their land. Then the agricultural husband purchased automobile, purchased refrigerator. Then three years, all the money was gone. Now, land trust is keep on coming every year for 20 years, 30 years. So it is better for the family. They receive small amount of rent every year for consecutive years. And then they can earn additional money from those purchases. So land acquisition is also important. And I'd like to propose land trust is the one of the method to shorten the acquisition of land, keeping the land to their own and lease the land to infrastructure companies. I want to talk much more, but uh, since time is limited, I'd like to stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dr. Naoki, for your wonderful um, comments. Especially you have bring new, two, three new dimension in the whole uh, discussion of the infrastructure, especially the education and the small uh, SMEs. These are, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to, we have, we have succeeded in coming to the end of our session and still we have 10 more minutes that has been kept for the, for the uh, member of the audience and thank you very much. It seems I have a few uh, interested persons, a lot of luminaries are also in the audience. They have expressed their, uh, their hope to hear from the designated discussion and the uh, paper presenter. Now, it is time to learn from them. Let me, with this word, let me declare the opening of the floor. And I have got three questions, and we have very limited time. We have only seven more minutes to go. And uh, let me invite Mr. Irat Kauser. Mr. Kauser, the, the system is, you are to, you, just you be specific with your question, and you may ask, from where you would like to have your answer? Mr. Hello. Hirad? Hi, I'm over yeah. here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my, my question to the panel is, uh, uh, all throughout the session we have talked about how we can channel uh, private uh, investments to the infrastructure sector. But uh, I, I haven't seen, but I was wondering that should we focus on attracting the uh, private funds to the sector, infrastructure sector first? Because uh, while I'm working on investment or structuring investment, the number one challenge I find is I don't have any data on that industry. So I think uh, uh, to start this, to channeling the private, uh, private investment or private funds to the infrastructure sector, there should be industry reports generated. But my question is that from your experience, who do you think should be generating these industry reports which will be available for the public? Are these the chambers, uh, the ch like uh, DCCI, or is it the government? Or there should be initiative from the private sector, and how to monetize that as well? Good question. Yes, you may. You may, sir. Thank you. Okay, uh, I have been, I was asked the same question in the Philippines. Minister Dominguez asked, what is the impact of each infrastructure and industries? And we are going to use satellite data. Then satellite data can go back to 10 years. Then before the infrastructure is constructed, then we can look at the night light. Then how many people are using that roads? How many people are using restaurants and, and so on? Then we can see the industrial development, first year only two kilometers, five kilometers, 10 kilometers. And that is a way, and we can do many, many things with that uh, satellite data. Even we can look at North Korea too. Thank you. Now, the second question, Mr. Deng Jian. Yeah, Hi. Mr. Deng Jian. Yeah. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I come from China. I do power investment uh, here in Bangladesh. A question would be, currently we see uh, quite a few power projects in construction. And the fact is that the uh, transmission line or the power grid in Bangladesh is quite behind schedule. And we do not see a very clear roadmap or the clear 
uh, plan for the transmission line. So, so the, the current fact is that every time I ask the government about the question when the output would be ready, when the transmission line would be ready, the answer I get from the government would be like, hey, don't worry, no worries. Once you sign the PPA, once you sign the IA, everything will be fine. Once you reach your COD, it will be there. But by that time, I would, I would have paid like 15 million US dollar security, power, uh, security uh, for the PPA uh, security. And that would be a question I would get asked by my investment committee. So my question for, I think it's for Wendy or Dr. Kahan. So what do you make of that? How, how, do, you solve this, uh, how do you solve this problem? Thank you. Yeah, you All right. Uh, I feel your pain. How about that? Uh, no. Uh, I think that transmission is definitely, I think, as uh, Dr. Khan uh, mentioned, definitely one of the next frontiers where we need to mobilize private investment. And independent pri uh, power transmission is obviously a model that has worked in uh, other countries, in Africa, in South America, uh, India as well. IFC is actually an investor in the Indian power grid. Um, and I think that actually the power grid of Bangladesh is considering how it can mobilize private investment to implement faster and, and better. I think as uh, Dr. Ahen mentioned, it's really about implementation. It's, it's not so much that, uh, I mean, yes, the funding is important, but the speed of implementation to meet your COD uh, is where they will probably need to be uh, mobilizing private investment. I don't think I'm... I'm, I'm revealing any secrets, but it's definitely something that is uh, in discussion. And uh, from, from our perspective, and I think from many in the private sector here working in the power and energy space, uh, the expectation is that um, transmission will also build on, on, on private models uh, that are effective globally. Actually, as I, said, uh, as I was telling you that uh, uh, for private involvement of uh, uh, of uh, private involvement in the uh, transmission and distribution uh, sector, we already have a policy. Uh, so it's a, it's a very simple issue. It's a issue of willing charge. You just uh, what do you call? Uh, you use uh, PGCB's uh, grid, uh, grid and uh, transmission network, and then uh, what do you call? So so that's an issue. And also there is this issue of new investment. So obviously it's like, a, like what you call electricity generation. So you set up the transmission lines and then you receive the wheeling charge and that's your revenue. So the policy is there as Wendy mentioned and as Selim also has alluded. So we really need to act on those. The policies are there and then uh, acting on those is the demand of the time. Thank you, Dr. Khan, for responding the question. The last question, I am taking the last question, Muhammad Farooq Rahman, Barisat Law. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I, my question is to uh, my sir, Dr. Fazul Kovir. I had the opportunity to work with him as a legal consultant while he was a secretary to the power division. Uh, I have, uh, in through his speech, he was talking about, he has gone through a uh, study for ADB and uh, been opportunity to discuss with many well-established uh, investors like Square and uh, other and, uh, who are also established in other sector. But uh, in our practice, uh, while we are working for clients and we deal with uh, investors in power sector, uh, mostly foreign investors as well as NRBs, but we have seen two, two projects. Uh, one is solar and another one is a, uh, a coal-fired power plant right now going on, and I'm not going to mention the name. But uh, the difficulty was finding and choosing a good joint venture partner. And the solar power plant totally failed because the joint venture partner uh, does not seem to be uh, in the same footing. And the coal fire plant is right now at a very serious uh, difficulty. Again, uh, the joint venture partner doesn't seem to be on the same footing. Uh, my question is uh, whether, I mean, I mean, is it because of the failure of uh, conducting due diligence, choosing partner, and which definitely brings a bad name for the country, or is it because of 
I mean, the not finding or there is not enough partner to choose from probably from a list. Thank you, sir. Okay. I you see, the uh, success of in the power uh, generation, particularly power, uh, what do you call, private investment in power generation, is due to the power cell. Because the power cell has been there, and then they have, what do you call, they develop the expertise to uh, process the project and so on. But the same kind of, what you call, uh, capacity building has not been done for other sectors. Even within the power sector, for what you call, core projects. So they have not done. So they used to... Uh, mainly what you call gas-based uh, power plant and also the later HFO-based what you call power plant. And uh, the, the same also applies to other sectors. For example, a private investor has uh, submitted a uh, proposal for a railway line uh, from Dhaka to Jamalpur, going there for t in, in two years. And in the railway ministry, there is no, uh, none to uh, what you call evaluate and process that project. So a lot of this, uh, is, uh, what you call, has also uh, to do with the capacity building. So we need to have similar institutions, similar to power cell in the what you call, road and communication ministries. And also in power cell, probably more diversified unit for what you call renewable energy-based power, and also coal-based power, and also for uh, ports, for other sectors also. So the, and as the gentleman uh, from uh, China uh, was uh, mentioning, you see, uh, you, you see, foreign investors have so many places to go, and uh, we should not wear out their patience. And you know, for them, uh, time is money. Uh, so when they spend time, is they're, they're spending money on you. And then, uh, so if we cannot, work, what do you call, uh, yeah, deliver our promise in a timely fashion, I'm sure they'll find out. Thank you. I have two more minutes to go to conclude this session. Let me go. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We have succeeded in concluding our session in right in time, and I have two and a half minutes. Yeah, two minutes, 30 seconds more. And I'm sure that we are wiser than one and a half an hour ago. Uh, we have learned a great lesson, experience shared by the uh, designated discussant. At the same time, the brilliant paper was presented by Windit this afternoon. We have learned a great deal. Bangladesh has to develop the infrastructure facilities, no doubt about it. Bangladesh will look into the recommendation derived from the keynote and the panel discussion of this session. Uh, already we proved that we are capable enough to develop small, medium, and big infrastructure by our own. Bangladesh is building Padma Bridge, Metro Rail, four lane highways, etc., etc., are the greater example of our capability. Hope deep support, 100 new special SEZ and other infrastructure needs to be, needs of the country will be reality in tomorrow. A stronger partnership between the government, private sector and foreign investors and the development partners may be institutionalized through establishing national infrastructure development and monitoring advisory authority, which Dhaka Chamber has very fondly named it NIDMA, a concept derived from DCCI. This was the positive hopes we would like to conclude this session. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for the presence of the, uh, of the brilliant and, and beautiful audience. I would like to express my thanks once again to the president to the paper presenter, Wendy Joe Warner. She has really given a very wonderful keynote a paper. At the same time, I would like to express my thanks to Mr. Nishan Kumar for sharing his experience, Singapore experience. At the same time, Dr. Salim Rahan has given a practical experience what he has been facing here on a day-to-day -day basis. 
and about Dr. Fazil Kabir Khan, um, who is genuinely one of the men who has really experienced all the problems faced uh, in the country by the investors. And the question also came from the floor relating to the experience shared by Dr. Faisal Kabir Khan. I would like to express my thanks to Dr. Naoki Yoshimo for sharing new, for bringing new dimension in, the, in this today's discussion. With this word, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to conclude this session just, and just to announce to the organizer that we have saved more than 45 seconds. That is the profit of the private sector. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Speaker, for a wonderful discussion. Now I request Mr. Kamrul Stam, FCS Senior Vice President, DCCI, to come up on stage and distribute crest to our distinguished guest. At first, I request Mr. Kamrul Stam to hand over the crest to our session chair, Mr. Aftabul Stam, FCA Director, Bangladesh Bank, and former President, Dhaka Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And now, the crest will be given to a keynote presenter of the session, Ms. Wendy Jo Werner, Country Manager, International Finance Corporation, the World Bank Group. And now, the speakers. I request Mr. Kamru Stam, FCA, to hand over the crest to Mr. Nishant Kumar, Executive Director, Garanjko, Singapore Office. Dr. Selim Raihan, Professor, Department of Economics, University of Dhaka, and Executive Chairman, South Asian Network and Economics Modeling. Dr. M. Fozul Kabir Khan, former Secretary, Ministry of Power, Energy and Mineral Resources, Government of the Republic of Bangladesh. And Professor Dr. Nayuki Yoshino, Chief Executive Officer and Dean, Asian Development Bank Institute. I request our speakers to remain on the stage for photo session. Ladies and gentlemen, with permission of the chair, I would like to announce the conclusion of the thematic session, Infrastructure Bangladesh Private Sector Engagement of DCCI International Conference, Destination Bangladesh. I hope audience enjoyed this wonderful discussion. Thank you all for joining here today. <laughs>